which is quite a long time now. And I've never done a process, not one of 21 or anything else. It came to me personally as a, a revelation, really, because I was vibrating at that uh, you know, height that was, would give it to, you, to us. So <clears throat> it's been a path, a very individual path. Um, but everything has fallen into place whenever anything was needed to be done, I just got it as a gift. And uh, it's a wonderful process to be able to live this way and just trust in, in providence and trust in the universe to, to give us all the things that we need. And uh, really, I have uh, my spiritual background comes from the Finthorn Foundation. I don't know whether you know, it's in the north of Scotland, uh, one of the greatest uh, spiritual communities in the world that has been existing for more than 50 years. And uh, I started going there in 1986. And uh, whatever I learned there uh, seemed to be uh, just what, what, my, what I needed, my spirit needed. And so I was in close contact with Eileen Keddy, who was one of the co-founders, and learned a lot from her. And in fact, when, uh, I went to a positive thinking workshop in Germany. And uh, there I saw a book of Eileen Keddy, Footprints on the Path. And uh, in this book, I found all the things I had been looking for. And so I absolutely wanted to, the rain is coming, yes, it's blessing us. <laughs> so, and did you see the, the rainbow? Just before outside, you know, when we arrived, uh, suddenly I, I looked over there and I said to Annika, who's my niece, who's with me, she said, look at this, the rainbow. And I always love this because it's such a good providence, you know, to see a rainbow. And it's a connection between heaven and earth. And that is really what I have always done, to connect heaven and earth. Because that would seem natural to me. And I've always worked for peace because I, I was born during the Second World War. And so I, I could never understand why people fight each other. And for me, it was really so important to live in peace together. So my desire had always been to learn languages and travel. And this is what I have done all my life. I used to work as a translator in the European Union. And uh, then since I earned quite a good living, I could do one big journey every year. And so, I went to see mainly the Aboriginal community, not only Aboriginal, but all the indigenous people all, all over in the world, and to f find their wisdom, whether they were still living that wisdom. And uh, so finally, when I came to uh, Finthorn in 86, uh, I was really ready for the next step. And it was when I was 49 years old. You know, seven by seven years is always a special time in our history, in our human history. Uh, and so 49 was a very important number. And so I went to Finthorn in that year. And in one of the meditations on the challenge of change, uh, I heard the voice, center of light. And uh, I thought, oh dear, center of light. I can't create a center of light. I have a full-time job and I'm traveling and I have all these activities. No way, no way. But, but finally I started crying and didn't know what to do. And, and finally I just said, yes. And then after the meditation, I went to see Eileen and I said, what do I do with this? You know, I can't create a center of light. And she was somebody very down to earth and she said, why don't you start by becoming one? And I said, oh yes, I can do that. 
And this is what I have done since then, to really be a center of light. And uh, then uh, I was reading the book that comes from Pinton, Opening Doors Within, with Eileen's guidance. And I read it every single day. It for, uh, each day in the year, it's one page, a meditation like. And it's about all the universal values. And it gives you a guidance for your life. And so every day I was reading it and asking, what can I apply here? And after 10 years of that, which was in the late 90s, I suddenly realized that I was always happy without needing anything anymore from the outside to make me happy. And so I thought, wow. And also I thought, and there's one more thing. I'm not hungry and I'm not thirsty anymore. But at that time I had never heard about anyone who could do that or who lived like that. And I kept asking around amongst all my friends, had anybody heard of someone? And finally somebody said, don't you know, Just Moheen? <laughs> I said, who is Just Moheen? Well, she's that Australian woman who teaches that. Oh, okay, then I will have to meet her. And so I looked her up. And in fact, she was coming to Belgium the weekend after. And she, uh, she came back to me and she said, uh, you know, I have an invitation here for you. She's doing her first international retreat in Australia. And I was going to Australia that year, and I was going to meet the Aboriginals, to spend a week with the Abri Aboriginals. And then uh, two weeks, so I said, well, I, had to, I wanted to meet the Australian Aboriginals. I will do that and just move later. And then two weeks before leaving, I got an email saying, unfortunately, the program with the Aboriginals has been uh, passed on to the week after. Can you still join? And I had planned for three weeks in Australia. One week uh, uh, was with my niece, Alika, who is here, who lives here. And uh, one week uh, with uh, the Aboriginals. And then I could do all the three things, and just Mohin then came and added itself. And you know, when we, we always say, when the pupil is ready, the master comes. So I did this, uh, and I had been vegetarian for many, many years before that. And uh, when we did the uh, retreat uh, in Australia, in the area here also, and uh, uh, I, I went over to Raw Food because we did meditations, uh, is it for me or not? And I didn't get, get a reply. And I thought, as long as I don't get a reply, I'm not doing it. So I started inviting Jas Mohin to Brussels, where I live. And uh, the next year she came and nothing happened. And so the year after, uh, she came again. And just a few days before leaving, I, I heard from inside, now is your time. And so uh, just before she, she arrived, I stopped eating. And then I, uh, she just came to Brussels for a weekend. So I joined her for a, a one week retreat in Norway, where she went. And then it, it just worked out like that. And I've never looked back. It just happened to me because it was the time and because I had the, the perfect vibration already for it. And uh, so I didn't really need the introduction through a 21 process or anyone anything else, it was just there for me already. And eventually, lots of times later, I talked to a Hawaiian uh, uh, shaman, and she said, from the Lemurians, she said, you know, you already had several lives like that before. And she said it was in China, and it was in Tibet, and it was, I think Thailand was the third country. And each time, you live for several hundred years. And so I understood why it was so easy for me. And in fact, uh, we, <coughs> uh, I don't know whether you know about Kryon, 
prion, it's uh, a being that channels really a very big spirit. And he always says all the people that come to him are old souls. And we are many, many of us who have come in this time, especially to help humanity making the flip to the new earth. And so uh, uh, I have all these memories from past lives uh, which have come to me in the course of my long life. And uh, it all seems, you know, just to come together like that. And as just Mohin says, uh, you know, we all have a special purpose in life. And so I'm one of these people who is here for this reason. And uh, I joined the Lemurian Choir also. I don't know whether you know that uh, we uh, came together for the first time in 2012, the 21st of December 2012. And we're singing Lemurian sounds, its tonings. And we meet in different uh, sacred places on the earth. And uh, we open up energy nodes that have been put into the earth. And all the people who come, the first year there were 950 of us. And now we have come to also to Uluru in the course of the years. Uh, since 2012, we, every year we've been, and we came to Uluru one year or so. So we are continuing the work, and it will take another few years before all the nodes uh, that they're talking about, the nodes and the nulls that join each other. And they are in different countries, but they are connected. And so each year we open up the energy uh, for the new world, and it's all about coming back into unity. <coughs> and uh, Jeff Mohin has written a book uh, which is called Reset, Unity Reset. It's her latest book, and it gives all the details about how it's going to work and what we are going to do. And one of the uh, really important things is the lifestyle. There's a lifestyle in eight points that she has given us. And it's about, and it's called the luscious lifestyle. I will talk more about it in my next talk. Uh, but I will give you the uh, points. So it's meditation, it's prayer, it's mastery of uh, uh, mind, it's silence in nature, physical exercise, light diet, uh, service, and sacred music. Those are the points. And if we practice that, then you know we, we can help it, uh, to get humanity into this unity, back into this unity. And so there's so many things. And if we really practice this actively, which I have really been doing since reading uh, Eileen Kelly's Opening Doors Within. This is uh, really helping us to, to go the step further. And it's also about having the vision of the new world. And uh, it's a new world into which we are going, where we won't, you know, all of us, we have come really as a humanity, as a whole group, we have come to Earth to uh, realize a, a really deep contact to matter. We had to really go into matter. We came from the stars, and we went into matter, and deep into the matter. And now we are at the point where we get out of the matter, and where more and more people get lighter and don't need to eat anymore. And you, you know, using this lifestyle. And so this is what's happening. So it makes, it makes sense, really. For me, it makes really sense. And also to have the contact to the divine one within us. That is so important, to see the bigger picture, to know that we are not only just human beings, but we are connected to the divine one within. <clears throat> and it's not outside anymore, it is really within our hearts. And if we you know, put everything that we do and say into this bigger sense, then 
we are so connected already to our divine one within and see it in everyone else and seeing it in everyone else beyond the humanity of the person. Really knowing, you know, this person is as divine as I am and as all the others. And in that way, we permit the person to open up and stop judging everybody and always saying, oh, this person is not good enough and they do this and they do that and, and they will never get anywhere and so on. Just accepting everyone as they are, as divine beings that are here for a purpose. And we each are different. We each have very special qualities. And this is the task for each one of us to find which are our own qualities. And that is so important to really find our gift for the world and live with that and demonstrate it and be the peace and be the love and be the joy. It's not enough to pray for peace or to pray, meditate for, for peace and love and so on, but be it, incorporate it. And in everything you do, just know that it is all this big sense and we are all together in this. And uh, I was with Just Mohin recently in um, Tibet. We went to Lhasa, just to Lhasa. We were in China before, and at the end of that trip, we went to uh, Lhasa. And, and she had asked me to come. She said, can you come and join me? I know I have to go to Tibet, but I don't know why. And so we arrived from China in Tibet at Lhasa airport, and we were there was a group of 20 of us, perhaps, who had joined us in the workshop in uh, China. And uh, suddenly I felt this push of energy, you know, really strong energy coming. And just when I, I watched her and she, she was really, <gasps> and she was getting the input and she was getting the words which I couldn't hear, but she told us afterwards. And the vision she got there was to see these prayer wheels, you know, this, uh, that the Tibetans have that, you know, they always put it in, and they put all their wishes for peace into it. And she saw one big, 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 and a golden one. And she, she realized that all the wisdom of the Tibetans was in there, and that all the wisdom of all the religions was in there and all the wisdom of the indigenous people everywhere uh, were in this drum and you know that everything was coming together and uh, you know if we can see the world like that that we are really really connected through all these wisdoms uh, teachings and and our own teaching and whatever we have learned whatever we bring to this life you know we have done so many reincarnations over the years. <clears throat> and to just know that they have all been there for the purpose of learning more, of putting it all together. And I've also done studies of interreligious studies. And so uh, it's all come together now, and it is there already. It's uh, just when sometimes talks also about uh, some of the cities where uh, the new city is already on top of the old one and it integrates more and more into it. And one of the cities, she said, where it was already integrated was Amsterdam. And there are others and uh, it's also about know, having the vision that, you know, this new kind of spirit is already there and we can access it. If we believe in it, we have so much influence, we have so much power, except that we mostly don't realize it. And just to be conscious of this power that is guiding us everywhere, <coughs> that helps so much. And uh, if we, all of us, you know, there's so many of us in the world, like she's talking about 85,000 people, but I think it's many more, because most of us, uh, live very discreetly and don't talk about it. 
and I go to the festivals, the planning festivals like in Italy where, where uh, uh, Nicola is and who organizes that. There are 300 people, you know, over 10 days in June and I've been at the festival in Romania, in Belgium and uh, in other places uh, and I get more invitations to go to other places. And, uh, you know, we are so much connected, and if we do it all together, there's a big chance. And more and more, when you see the young people now demonstrating everywhere, it's fabulous to see, you know, they want the new world. And uh, so many of their parents don't understand it yet, and say, you must go to school, don't do all this, you know, rebel uh, sense and so on. But it is coming, and we can see it also. Politics doesn't work anymore, except in, a, in a New Zealand. <laughs> we have all heard about her, <laughs> yeah, the president of uh, New Zealand, or the prime minister. That's fantastic what she has done. Uh, you know, and all the people who ha have the consciousness already. And I think there are millions and millions and millions of us who are working for the common good. And we really want to change this earth. But we are not in the papers. Nobody knows about us. And which, on the other hand, is a good also. Because we can do our work and it's being done. And so we can contribute, all of us, in our own ways, in our individual ways. And just believe that we are powerful, how powerful we are. And we may not be half of the people yet, but we have more power because we are vibrating higher, which means that we can carry everybody on. I still remember in the earlier years of spirituality, of new age, they said, you know, those people who have the right conscien consciousness, there will be a spaceship coming to pick them up and take them to the other planet. And that never sounded right for me. I thought, you know, we need everybody to go together. And so now this is what's happening. And I think as soon as, as everything breaks down in the normal world, if, if you can call it normal still, <laughs> because everything is breaking down. The schools are not up to it anymore. The children get bored at school. And uh, it's really ne necessary to create the new world, and we are doing it by our inner work. <clears throat> and it's amazing what we can achieve. And as soon as you know all these things will break down, then all these people will come up and help. Because we are all working for the common good. We want the world to change. And really, we are all together in that. And there's also so much to change here. You know, like uh, the, the male-female thing, we need to be the same. You know, they have the same power. There's still so much going on in the world that uh, women get less paid than men, and so on. And I've always been dreaming to find a partner that would be the same, you know, that we could work in the same, and I never found one. So eventually I never got married, but I have a beautiful family thanks to my sister. <laughs> she has had four children and uh, had many grandchildren and so on, and Annika is part of that also. So. Uh, it is nice to have a big family, and I have so many friends all over the world, so I don't miss my family. And I'm really happy all the time. And I'm married to the whole world. <laughs> and I'm always happy and you know, carrying that out into the world <clears throat> and enjoying every moment of my life. And, and I'm in gratefulness all the time. I say thank you, thank you, thank you all the time for all the gifts that I'm getting, you know, and really seeing everything in the positive light. Wherever, whenever you get angry, say stop, stop being angry. It doesn't take you anywhere. You know, just know that everybody is doing their best and that will help, but not getting angry. Angriness is, is a futile energy. <clears throat> but we can immediately switch to you know, gratefulness and knowing the divine is within and we can make it all together. So let's all go on and do that and really work for that. And I would also like to open the space for questions and answers if you want.
Yeah, we saw it. Uh, yeah. You mentioned getting together with a whole lot of people to do these meditations. Mm. Sorry? You mentioned getting together with people to activate the nodes yeah. of the earth and the relationship. How, how do you get involved with it? You know, just, uh, you can think, uh, that's also one thing which uh, I learned from a book uh, which is called The Power of Eight. And it is uh, people who, uh, it's one of the, uh, I can't remember the, the author's name, but the book is called The Power of Eight. And she uh, suggests that we form prayer circles and that we concentrate on, on our own power, divine power within, and uh, uh, create circles of eight people in our mind. And everyone can do it. And then uh, uh, we can put people into the circle. And uh, both the people in the circle and the people around the circle, they uh, get the same benefit. And it's amazing. And also to make our t time, special times when we do it. I do it, I have two groups in Belgium, one in Brussels and one in Liège, and uh, once a month each. And uh, also we have decided that we do this meditation, each one of us, wherever we are, every Wednesday at 10 o'clock for 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, in quietness and think, think of one or several circles and put the people we think might need it into the center or even ourselves when we have some illness or so. And uh, that is a big help and more and more people do it. And I talk to it about everybody I see and in my talks. And so all these people can join wherever they are every Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Just stop working for 10 minutes and center yourself on that. And it's one of the means that we can do. And whenever we think you know, of good things and uh, wanting to be with people or uh, singing songs, singing mantras, there are so many ways of doing it. Get together with people. You know, put up healing circles wherever you are. Each one of us can do that. It's not very difficult. And so, you know, we are helping in our ways and, and mainly also because of our thinking and the lifestyle we lead. You want it? The next one. Hello. Yes, you do in a way, yes. I, I don't know all my lives. I, I know some, and uh, I, I know that certain ones, more important ones, because I know, for example, that I was Hildegard von Bingen. I don't know whether you know her. She was an abbess in the Middle Ages, and she, was, uh, she got visions, uh, holy visions, and she uh, could remember them very closely and she explained them and there was a monk who painted them. So you can get a look at the pictures also. And she had contact to the Pope and to all the chiefs of government of the time. And uh, she was traveling a lot. And uh, when she did not share her vision, she became ill. And she lived for, and she, she was 90 when she died. <coughs> and I had, at one point I had felt a friend of mine was going to um, organize a, a festival of uh, historic persons. And he said, you know, I would, everyone who participates is going to represent a historic person. And then I said, oh yes, I'll participate and I will be Hildegard von Bingen. And I, suddenly I thought, why do I say this? You know, I don't really know too much about her. But I just knew she was an abbess. And so I went uh, to Google and find out that she was lived in the Middle Ages and uh, all the things she had done. And then I bought all her books and I never read them because they were inside. <laughs> I had just been to 
uh, America and the, uh, at the uh, University of Auckland in America, there was uh, a professor who was a fan of uh, Hildegard von Bingen. And he has written quite a few books about her. And I've just been there and bought one of the books there and met him. And uh, so I had that with me. And I gave it to Jasmine. She said, I read it overnight because I don't need sleep very much. And she gave it back to me in the morning and she said, what's your relationship to her? I said, you know, I pray with her every day and I really, I feel her close to me. And she said, don't you think you could be her reincarnation? And it just came out, yes. <laughs> so that's why I know that, for example. And other, I have sometimes memories when I'm in a, a, like in Japan, that was very, when I arrived at the airport, I thought, I know this place. I know, I know the country. Even the language seemed familiar. And these things, when you think, I already know that, this deja vu thing. And sometimes I, I've realized like that, or traveling in the country, I, I see places and I think, I know these places already. And so finally, I realized that all the travels I've done in my life was like revisiting places I had been before. And so sometimes you just remember, or you can go to people who channel, they can tell you sometimes also. So that's another way of remembering. Any more questions? Okay. Um, so, me, I know your age, and I know when you stopped eating, but I think, you know, doing this process is something that is accessible by everyone at any age. And like, you're one of the most beautiful examples of this group. So, can yeah. you tell us, like, at what, what age you, you can say the, the year, but you can say which age? Yes, I'm 82, <laughs> but I always say I am really 28. <laughs> And that, that's what we can all do also. Society tells us that when you age, you lose your mind, you lose your uh, sight, you lose your hearing, and uh, you are sick and all that. If you believe that, you get it. And I have taken all that out of my mind. I know that, oops, I have eternal youth. And you can all choose to do that because you know, it is just society telling us, but we don't need to believe it. And through our lifestyle, by seeing the divine in everyone and everything, we don't need to age. Okay, there are wrinkles, but my spirit is still young. And I travel the world still, all the time, and uh, I never feel tired, and I don't need much sleep. But I do eat sometimes. Uh, and it's also because I don't want to tell everybody that I never eat, you know, and uh, I'm special or so. I just want to be down to earth. I want to share with everyone. And so when I go to a party or um, invite, uh, invited somewhere, I take a glass of red wine, I take a glass of champagne, I take a plate and I put food on my plate and I pick just a little bit. People never look whether you eat or don't eat. They just see the same on your plate that they have. And then I put the plate down at some point, and I just have my, a little bit here or there. And you know, I don't need to tell anybody. And it's fun also to do something with other people, to have the joy of having a glass of champagne. I love the bubbles. <laughs> and so, you know, just uh, live a life where everybody can see I am in joy all the time. And I am always doing things uh, that make me happy. And I love everybody. And I talk about love. And I talk about peace. And I am the peace. And it, I'm really here to be an example. And uh, this is how I live. And anyone else can do it. And I always say, well, if I can do it, you can do it. Yes? Matt said it before, but it's so noisy, I couldn't hear it very well. So, with the prana, I mean, how did that sweet power happen where you begin to, to release all the energy? Like, is it, is it just your breath? I'm, I'm very new to this. 
Yeah. No, I, I don't do anything special. I just trust, you know, there's a, the, uh, uh, I call it the universal energy that is there for us that nourishes it. And it's everywhere, and science calls it the black energy because they can't deal with it. They can't do anything with it. And so if you believe that it's there, and, you know, all the people who are healers or who work with energies and so on, they all use it. And we can use it and we can see the effects. It really works. And so I don't even do any special exercises with it. I just trust that the universe nourishes me. You know, I know that this happens and I can ask for this nourish. And I also say, and if I eat, I program that all the the things that I eat are being transmuted into light and uh, irradiated out into the earth. And I also radiate out into the world all the time. Because uh, I, I imagine stars, even when I'm in my car, to go out into the world forever, or when I go into the supermarket, I just spread the energy of love, light, and uh, peace everywhere. You know, we can all do that. It's simple exercises, and it's easy. So, you know, you can all do it. You can all participate. Yep. <laughs> so responding to the same question, are there, are there any, like, you know, when you're talking or you know that the universal energy is here to create the way you want to love? Jasmine mentions that there is a shift in the frequency, and it, it basically, you feel that like you're full. Yeah. So there is no lack or all hunger is gone. Yes. In your situation is shifting in that universal mm -hmm. force that's there. Are there been something that is tangible that you felt on a physical, on an emotional, on a spiritual point of view, mental point of view? Like is there anything mm -hmm. that is tangible that you can, you know, rely on? Everyone yeah. is different but from you. Yeah. Yes, I uh, when I started <coughs> I felt this energy in my body. I really felt that, uh, you know, a new force was in my body. And uh, I, I was never tired, and I, I needed less and less sleep. And I lost about six, between six and 10 kilos in the first six months. But I could feel this energy in my body that was really, I knew this was right for me. So I didn't get worried about it. You know, I just knew this is what it is. <clears throat> and I know some people in my family, they were afraid. They said, you must go and see a doctor, and uh, you have lost your radiance and things like that. But I knew it was right. And so I just the belief, I have this belief that moves mountains. And I know that all is very well. And we will go into this new world where there won't be any hierarchy anymore. We all take responsibility. There won't be money anymore. There won't be the people who can buy everything because there won't be money anymore. So they, they will be lost. They can't find, they can't dominate us anymore. And lo the money dominates us still in so many ways. And so this will be gone and we will all be on the same level and we all take responsibility for ourselves and for our surroundings. And then there will be new schools coming, and, and there is young, m amazing young people are already around now. And I meet them sometimes in the festivals also, and there's this young girl of 17 in Switzerland, for example, who has started writing books, and she, she has really, she, she got channelings, and she knows about the new world and so on. She, she is talking about it much more, and there are others all over the world, uh, really, uh, and all the children nowadays, you know, they are so conscious, and they talk to their parents and say, come on, let's do it, and so there is, everything is moving, and they are depolluting de the oceans, and there's so much going on, and it's just amazing, and if we think of only all the good things that are happening, then we know we can go on.
and we have the power all together to do that. Yep. So do you feel that transition is a gradual thing or is it like quantum? I think it is, it is both. It is both, you know, it, it's preparing itself and I think there's a lot of quantum effect in it. But at the same time, it, it will be soft. You know, it won't be like an explosion or so. You know, it won't break anything. It will just be soft. <laughs> and it will, it's, it's already waiting for us, for the right, uh, you know, the, the right vibration of humanity, the consciousness of humanity it needs to be at a special level and we're almost there. So it won't take, and it really, it won't take much longer because looking at the, the, the heads of state at the moment all over the place, sometimes you wonder. Um, but this is what it is at the moment, and we need to see this picture so that people get really fed up with politics and, and economics and so on, and all this favoritism and the pharma, pharma, uh, pharmacy, you know, uh, they get all the money for healing illnesses, whereas we can feel we can heal ourselves from the inside. I have had a breast cancer and I'm still in the healing process and I haven't done anything medical. I went to the uh, Cancer uh, Institute in Basel. And I, was, I got such a shock by the vibration in there. It was really hard. I, it took me, I had to breathe deeply to, whoo, to come back to my own consciousness. And then they, they talk about fighting the cancer. And I, I never wanted that. I didn't want to fight it. I, I accepted it as a sign, and I had to do something about it. But finally, I found the black cells. I don't know what I, any of you. It's also very well known in, in Australia. There's an Australian who's written a book about it also. And uh, I used that. And it's really, it, it created, uh, it was quite a big lump on my breast outside. And I put the black self on, and then it really killed the, the dark cells. And uh, it created a hole where the, the cancer was before. And so I'm still in the healing process of this hole. But I can see every day how it changes, how it closes again. So anything is possible if you believe. Any more questions? You eat water? Yeah. You, you eat water? I dr drink very little, very little. Sometimes, you know, when, sometimes when I wake up at night, I, I just drink a little bit, but uh, I don't need it at all. And when I drink, it leaves me within half an hour. And also when I eat, it leaves very quickly. Can you come to the microphone and say it here? Yeah, the pleasure of food. You know, that's why I still eat also sometimes. Just a little, to have the taste again yeah. of that. You know, just do it a little bit. Why not? It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's not so important. It's not really the, the fact of not eating. It is just the consciousness that goes with it. And so if you eat a little, that's fine. Yeah. There are quite a few people who still eat a little bit. And when I eat, I really eat the things that I love. And I, I love a glass of red wine, and I love a glass of champagne. Yeah. And uh, sometimes it's a special food, or uh, like in, 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 in China, for example, I was there with uh, Jasmuhin, and we were in Huangshu, 
and they uh, want to become the first city in China where that's vegan. And so there was this vegan restaurant that invited us to, for a meal. But we said, you know, don't give us much. Give us many different little things. And so they had done such a good job. It was beautifully to look at it already. And then all these little bowls of food. And we could test a little bit here and there. And we just enjoyed it. Yeah. And that's fantastic. And you get more and more vegan restaurants all over the world. In Europe, it's amazing how many nowadays there are. In Brussels, there's quite a few. Yeah. And so just have a little bit. And it is about that. It's just about the tasting. Isn't yes, it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just yes, just have, of, just have that little taste. Teaspoon of tahini, yeah. You know. mm. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and keep it in your mouth and, and linger on it. You know, just eat a, a spoonful and yeah. linger on it. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Exactly. That's fine. Yeah. It doesn't matter. 